I just thought this was a great example of why Jordan White and the Krakoan Air failed. No planning, no real cross communication when they wanted to use ideas from other people's platforms. Going out there and making pointless decisions based on emotion rather than having any story elements or things to go into the future. Making poor choices on who should be working on what projects that would actually sell and move the needle. And he basically just kind of failed across the board. Jordan White had an interview with Adventures and Poor Taste for X-Men Monday, pulling back the curtain on what happened during his time as X-Men group editor, things that changed, the reason that they did things. And I don't know if you noticed this, Doc, it did seem like Mr. White was particularly hostile during this interview. I don't know if I'd say hostile, but very, very, very much defensive because a lot of this interview was him trying to run cover for the fact that everything stopped in like phase one of Krakoa because they didn't have any plans. I understand the adventurous part is a big part of the fun rather than the destination. A good editor can kind of take themselves out of the day-to-day minutia, pull back, see that 30,000 foot view. And be like, oh, if we take it this way, it's going to open up this, 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 and this possibility. But instead, it was just kind of do what you want. And he did have some caveats going into this. He said, what this isn't going to be is me making canon up for things. This isn't going to be, oh, they brought up a good question. And now I'm going to tell you the definitive answer, even though it didn't appear in the comics. First of all, there's no reason to do that. But also, even if I did that, It wouldn't actually count because no other creators or editors would view X-Men Monday as actual canon. No offense to which Adventures in Poor Taste responded, well, that's your opinion. And I guess he laughed and said, like, the official Marvel policy is that letters pages aren't even canon. So certainly was on the defensive going right into this because he knew he was going to be spilling some beans and talking some bullshit. I get it. He's he's trying to spill the beans, but also he's trying to protect himself of where he wanted to go with things because or what he can claim he wants to do. He wanted to do with things because it's all the things that he can only look at in hindsight. He was asked about several of the mysteries that were planted within the Krakoan era during the, the entire run really. And one of the big ones out there was Kitty pride, not being able to use the Krakoan gates never answered. This is what Jordan white said. Okay. So this one where I didn't think it was as mysterious as the audience did, So maybe we didn't do a good enough job of being clear on it. To my mind, it was just connected to her phasing power the whole time. It was that her phasing power disrupts technology. The Krakoan gates are a unique kind of technology that involves things moving through or going into places they're not supposed to go. And her powers are similar to that. As she disrupts technology, I thought it was kind of clear that it was just some sort of power-related feedback. And then when the gates flipped and suddenly they didn't work for anyone, they started to work for her. That was never clear. That was one of the big mysteries opening up. What happened to Kitty Pride? What is it about her that she can't go through the gates? Never answered it. And they think that it was very clear. It certainly was not. And the reason why it wasn't clear is because Jordan himself, as well as John Hickman, made it unclear intentionally. They want they built it being a mystery. If you had just had Kitty fail to walk through, you know, a thing and be like, well, fuck, I guess my phasing disrupting technology doesn't work on plant technology either. It would have cleared it up immediately. Or Forge. Yeah, exactly. A scientist. Somebody explaining that, and it takes literally one line. It doesn't even take a big thing. But the fact that they intentionally turned it into a mystery implied that there was something much, much, much bigger. And by the way, Jordan, Her powers don't interfere with technology. They interfere with circuitry. There's a difference because it's electrical impulses, not all technology. That would also imply that it uh, interferes with the fucking steam engine because the steam engine was technology at one point, too. She doesn't interfere with fire. She interrupts with circuitry. There's a difference. And they certainly made it a big point. You know, we were supposed to be wondering, why can't she get through the gate? She was questioning herself. Why can't I get to the gates? There are other members on her team wondering, why can't she get through the gates? For them to act like you were supposed to have picked it up along the way is complete utter bullshit. And I think that was a bold-faced lie. I think they were setting something up. They just decided they didn't want to reveal it. Maybe it was stupid. Like the thing that was kind of implied to me, she might have been somehow connected to the children of the vault. They had mentioned the Neo at one point. Another reference back to an abandoned Claremont plot thread. 
that there were other species of mutant out there that could possibly go back to uh, Warren Ellis's time on Astonishing X-Men. So there's a lot of ways that it could have gone a different way to imply that she's a mutant, but not exactly and maybe kind of different. Or there was something much more sinister or nefarious or something that was a that was a big foreshadowing to something else because here's the thing his excuse of well whenever the gateways stopped working for everyone else suddenly she was able to use them it's still technology it is still circuitry even if it is living tissue so just because it didn't work before she'd still be disrupting it disrupting something that works Whenever it gets flipped to not working, doesn't suddenly make it work. It's still disrupted, not working thing. Yeah, none of that stuff really held water for me. They also talk about uh, some of the key characters that were set up by Hickman himself. You know, one of them being Namor, another one being Franklin Richards. Although we did have Franklin Richards retcon into being, I guess, a human, not mutant. And this is what he had to say about that particularly. Mr. Sinister was talking about the fact that Franklin is one of the Omega-level mutants. Uh, he doesn't have the DNA of yet, and he wants it, so 1 million percent. But again, as much as we wanted to use him because he's a mutant, he's clearly a Fantastic Four character, and they made the decision that I, sorry guys, do not agree with to make him not a mutant, and he's their character to do that with, and that's the direction they went, and as a result, he was not on the table for us anymore. Basically setting up plans with big characters, with big applications, but never actually going out there and coordinating you know, the Fantastic Four creative team or the team, obviously, that was on the Avengers that would have been in charge of Namor and all this would have been under the purview of Tom Revord at the time. So going out there and setting up stuff they weren't even authorized to do. It could have been a case where they had a plan or the the idea got approved until it didn't get approved, probably because... Tom Brevoort is really, really close with uh, Slotto Blocktavius, and Slot said, I don't want him playing with my toy box. Well, he was over on Fantastic Four. Didn't matter whether the fact that, you know, Jonathan Hickman's a, ca- a creator that sells and Dan Slot is one that doesn't, Dan Slot got his way. So it was approved until Dan Slot was in that office on Fantastic Four and suddenly didn't want anybody else playing with any of the toys that might be associated with his toy box. Yeah, it's crazy. It's one of the dumbest retcons I've ever seen in comic books. It literally achieved nothing. Yeah, it really did. It, it achieved um, Dan Slott proving that he has more power and more influence uh, being somebody who has never sold a comic book on his own name in his life than Jonathan Hickman, who routinely, well, does, whether I like it or not. No, Dan Slott proved that he had the power. That was the, the point that it needed to prove. It had no, it didn't have to prove a story point, just who was actually you know, more influential in the Marvel offices. And it, people were actually were, were very excited what they were going to do with Namor in House of X Powers of 10. They're like, oh, he's the first mutant. We haven't seen the character really play with the X-Men in a long time. It seemed like he was going to be a big deal. And then he got yanked out from underneath him as well to go and work on that Jason Aaron stuff. That literally went nowhere. He was an yeah. eco-terrorist, and then he just kind of dissipates into the background of the story. Yeah, because they didn't have a fucking plan for him. They, they just didn't want anybody else to use him in case. He was a just-in-case character in the Avengers office. And once again, who wins? Tom Brevoort, the the human beaver in a hat, gets to throw his weight around and tell other people no, and it didn't matter how much those other people sold better than he did. Well, and they had probably better plans, I imagine, because it seemed like Namor or Namor, I don't want to dead name the character, and Franklin Richards had big plans in store for them in X-Men. Of course, none of those came to fruition because there just wasn't good coordination and planning throughout all of this. Speaking of which, asked about if they had plans for the Shi'ar Empire. Remember, they went out to, to space during New Mutants. He said, this is sort of a bummer in some ways. This is probably the saddest part of the entire thing. That was a book Jonathan was going to do that he was really excited about because it was a Sam and Bobby book. So for him personally, that is the one he would have loved the most. It just wouldn't be the one that would sell the most. So it wasn't a top priority. So Jordan White decided not to greenlight green light the Jonathan Hickman Cannonball and Sunspot team-up book that he was clearly setting up in New Mutants that was the better story in New Mutants because it didn't have enough selling power to it, even with the name of Jonathan Hickman attached to it and everything that he had done already at that point. 
But we did get X Corp from Tinny Howard. We also got the Beak story in New Mutants from Ed Brisson. That was a complete turnoff. We also got splitting up a fucking Psylocke and, and one of them becoming, you know, a Captain Britain that never worked out. We got Exterminators. We got, we got so Legion. many fucking stupid stories throughout yes. this run that weren't top priorities. But the Jonathan Hip and Passion Project with his two fucking favorite New Mutants wasn't greenlit because we all fucking know why because jonathan hickman actually has to work for getting projects pushed through and every single other idiot that he brought into that office doesn't they get to get by because the soft bigotry of low expectations jonathan hickman only selling sixty thousand units is so much worse than leah williams selling her 10th volume of eight thousand units Absolutely, because that's the comic industry now, and none of it is even remotely, remotely surprising. He still has to work for a living. Everyone else is a charity case. There was stuff with Sunspot. I remember him being on the moon during, what was that stupid Dan Slott Fantastic Four Avengers book? Oh, Empire? Empire. During Empire, he was on the moon representing the X-Men. It seemed like he was going to be doing something. They also had him on the cover of one of the House of X, Powers of X issues, sitting on the throne. And he was a big central character involved in the cosmic side of Al Ewing's sword and X-Men Red until it kept getting stuck and dragged into whatever event was going on then. I still find it shocking that, that Jonathan Heckman, with all of his success, wasn't able to do his passion project, but everyone else got to do their little pet projects and stuff. But it just kind of shows you just how incompetent Jordan White was. He thought a Sunspot Cannonball team-up book from Jonathan Hickman had no selling power, but he thought X-Corp from fucking Tini Howard was something that was going to make waves. Or X-Factor from Leah Williams was going to make waves. Or Trial of Magneto, which wasn't even about Magneto from Leah Williams, would make waves. Only certain people need to perform. Other people don't. They get guaranteed projects because that is the charity office. It is fucking make a wish for half retarded lesbians. Jonathan Hickman, as long as he was in that office, considering he was probably very much the highest paid, he had a threshold, a bar that he had to reach sales wise but none of these other people do because he also needed to prop them up and subsidize them with the profits that he made on a book. If there wasn't enough profit for them to subsidize the rest of them, they couldn't do it. But once he was left and not there to subsidize their projects, apparently that was still okay. We'd still do their projects. I just remember the Shi'ar being a pretty big deal. They had the little... Uh, they stole the, the brood egg and you had the little like frog lawyer guy and all these things that were being set up and nothing really ends up happening with them. I do think we saw the brood egg a, a couple of years later, maybe. Well, we also saw it so that brew is now the king of the brood so that the X-Men four years later can decide to release xenomorphs onto Earth uncontrolled just to beat Orcus. Remember, they're doing that right now. Yeah, but they never showed it. They just said they were doing it, but we haven't got to see all the millions of people they've slaughtered. Um, yeah, because they're not going to show that because that's that, that would be admitting the giant plot hole of releasing a, mil, a billion xenomorphs onto fucking Earth and how big of a slaughter that would turn into very quickly. The final thing he kind of got into, which just shows you what a a moron the guy is, talking about making Gwenpool a mutant. He said, look, Gwenpool is my child, and I love her. I wanted to protect her as well, and like Leah said, making her a mutant seemed like a good way to protect her. We didn't have specific plans for her, no. We didn't go, let's get her in here so we can use her in X, Y, or Z. It was just, let's A, put her in there because I'll protect her, and B, put her there because I'm the X editor. So now that's backfired. They just did it because he has a special affinity for Gwenpool. I wonder why Jordan White has a special affinity for the character. Gwenpool is literally Heather Onto. So his work wife that's no longer there, he, he needs to keep her close to home. Everything about this, the psychology of it, is really, really creepy and stalkery. 
he needs to keep Gwenpool. He needed to keep her in the ex office because nobody else could play with Heather. Well, it's a character that has no cachet, no real selling value, and except for as a variant cover. And there's nothing really to do with the character. It was just a wasted opportunity. It was a waste of time to even go and do that. Of course it is. But somebody else might play with the comic book version of his work wife, and he can't well allow that. And that's where, yeah. This it seems really like crazy. his priorities were all out of whack. Uh, yeah, very, very much so. Because, I mean, in fairness, though, honestly who cares no one was going to do anything with her in the regular marvel universe but he had to be protective of her to bring her into his office and ha 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 ha, you're not in charge of that office anymore so that's what he means by it backfired well i would say the entire krakoan era backfired on him and he was exposed there's a reason that uh, he's not moving over to the avengers line they went and found will moss and he's been promoted and essentially Jordan White has been demoted after his time on X-Men because he did such a bad job. And if I were him, I would also be, you know, not feeling very good about this. Maybe be a little chippy during interviews like this. Apparently there's going to be a second part. We'll see if there's anything interesting to come out of that. But I just thought this was a great example of why Jordan White and the Krakoan Air failed. No planning, no real cross communication when they wanted to use ideas from other people's platforms. Going out there and making pointless decisions based on emotion rather than having any story elements or things to go into the future, making poor choices on who should be working on what projects that would actually sell and move the needle. And he basically just kind of failed across the board. And there's a reason Hickman left, and he's been sitting over, a, I, I guess, an empire of ashes that burnt down a long time ago. I understand a little bit of the fly by the seat of your pants, not really have a, a plan, maybe have a very, very loose outline, but he, he does that thing that everybody does whenever they're accused of not having any foresight, which is assume that the only two ways to run a line or a, any sort of project, because he's essentially a project manager, the only two ways to run it are with absolutely zero plan and just go wherever the fucking wind takes you, or you must have absolutely everything scripted down to the page before you start. And that's the way he acted here, that those are the only two outcomes, that there can't be somebody that has a vague outline, a general direction, and somebody that's looking at it from a 30,000 foot view while everyone else is kind of on the ground in the weeds doing the work. And his job as the editor giving it the 30,000 foot view is to keep steering them in the direction that the outline designs. It's, it needs, it doesn't need to be calculated down to the last millisecond but it, it can't be a rudderless fucking ship either and that's exactly what he turned that office into a completely rudderless ship and you can see why jonathan hickman left because he went in there with a three-year plan he had stuff mapped up for three years straight and this is the beginning point this is the end point and that was just not going to work with jordan white it was going to be oil and water and i do want to say thank you very much to doc for talking about this you would like the fully unedited conversation about this week's x-men monday expose with jordan white talking about the hidden secrets of krakoa you do need to go with thinking critical patreon if you support us there we'd like to give you bonus content and awesome podcasts there's a link in the video description to the patreon as well